again. It's so great that if you can't join us physically in the building at the moment, that we're able to connect with you this way. My name's Alan. I'm the Senior Minister here at St James Croydon. And my name's Gavin, one of our ministry trainees here at St James. If you've joined us in recent weeks, you'll know that we're focusing on the idea of death. How can we deepen our faith in Christ and our walk with Him? Gab, this has been an unusual year. Mm. How has God deepened your faith this year? One of the um, one of the funny things about this year is just having been separate from uh, our church community, our church family uh, for so much of the year, being you know online doing church and growth group and over Zoom and that sort of thing. And it's felt to me really easy to think that things are out of my control, that uh, because I'm not seeing someone, that they must be feeling really disconnected or, um, yeah, that their experience of church community or their spiritual life must therefore be uh, going through some sort of season of difficulty or trial. But um, in God's goodness, I, you know, he's shown me time and time again that he is faithful, that his people are in his care, not, not mine or in St. James's. Um, and yeah, he's really shown me time and time again that he is faithful and even in this unusual time, he's, he's got it all under control and he's holding his people close to his heart. Yeah, yeah thanks for sharing. Yeah. Well, it's been a great uh, week or two here, not just with focusing on uh, depth on Sundays, but also with our prayer retreat mm -hmm. and our 10 minutes to shape your day. It's been a really fruitful season for us. Well, the great news of the gospel is that though we are sinful and ought to be far from God, he draws us near through the forgiveness of his son. And so it's only right that this Sunday we join together in a prayer of confession, acknowledging to God the times that we've failed uh, and to ask him for his generous forgiveness in our lives. So please pray with me in the words that will appear on the screen. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And please join me as I continue to pray. I'll be praying for our ministry partners, the Clapham's in Japan, and some of the prayer, uh, words of the prayer I'm about to pray come from the prayer book, so they might sound a bit familiar. So let's continue to pray. Lord, you made all things, and you made us in your image to enjoy and govern them. We thank you for your work of creation, for the beauty we enjoy, for human skill and artistry. We thank you for community, friendship, family and love. And above all, we thank you for Jesus, your Son, through whom you created all things and by whom you sustain them. We thank you that he became one of us and died to reconcile all creation to you in heaven and on earth and to call us into peace with you. We thank you for our sister and our brothers, Marky, Nathan, Ian and Samuel Clapham. We thank you for your grace shown to them in calling them out of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son you love. Thank you for the gifts and faith you have granted Nathan and Marky that they have gone on mission in Japan. And so we pray for them now in the midst of COVID. With their ministries remaining online and the experience of isolation continuing, we pray for a renewed motivation and seal for you in, and for your gospel in their hearts. We pray that you would direct sanctify and govern their hearts in the ways of your laws so that through your mighty protection they may be kept safe in body and soul. Please enable them to persist in godliness and faithfulness as they go through isolation and to model to their sons the deep-seated joy that we find in the gospel. We pray for their university ministries and ask that those attending would not be deterred by the online format uh, but actually that the move to online would instead, by your grace, Lord, be an opportunity for people who would not otherwise have connected to come and to investigate the claims of Christ. Lord, may your word be powerfully at work in the lives of those who read it in these groups. 
Father, it's sad to hear that so many in Japan are suffering from joblessness or unemployment in the midst of the pandemic. And so we pray also for Marky's ministry to the homeless at this time. And in, th- in their culture of merit and honour, Lord, may the gospel of grace speak powerfully into these people's lives. Father, we pray for the work of your Holy Spirit in this nation, that the gospel would spread beyond our expectations or beliefs in that country, and that the number of believers there would continue to multiply. Yes, Lord, we know that you are in fact at work in in Japan and as in the whole world. Uh, We pray for Shikikun, who is the non-Christian attending Bible study at Waseda University. We pray that your spirit would be working even in his life to take the veil from his heart that he might be able to trust in the Lord Jesus. And we ask that he might be like the good soil, that he would accept your word and allow it to set deep roots in his life and produce much fruit. And lastly, Lord, we pray for our governments as they respond to the ongoing coronavirus situation, uh, both those here in Australia and over in Japan. Enable our governments to respond well to the developments as they occur, to govern well for the sake of the people so that life is preserved and so that the vulnerable are protected. Direct and prosper their work to the advancement of your glory, Lord, and for the safety and welfare of our people, so that peace and happiness and justice may be established among us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to say together the Apostles' Creed. And in doing this, we're not just expressing our individual faith, we're expressing our fellowship with all who believe these things, both today and in centuries past. Let's say these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, having spoken of the God we believe in, we're now going to hear from his word. Our Bible reading today comes from Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17, reading through to verse 32. The Apostle Paul writes, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. 
anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, so that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The deep underground foundations grown by the tree ensure that it is connected to deep and unseen sources of water, nutrients and life. Once these are secured, growth can then happen. The space has been filled. This tree will last for centuries. Welcome to St. James. My name is Miles. Uh, we're in the midst of a series called Depth. We are seeking Jesus in an age of distraction and quick fixes. Uh, and today we're talking about God's family and our interaction with that and how uh, God's family is an instrument of our growing in Jesus. Now, all of us have families. Uh, we all are shaped by our families for good or for bad. Some of us admire people in our families. We love them. We long to be like them. Uh, some of us are the complete opposite. We want nothing to do with our parents. We don't want to be like our siblings. Uh, there's that weird cousin we don't want to hang out with. Uh, we have a, a strange and, and a difficult relationship with our family. There are places of tension. And then, and then for some of us, we just don't know our families at all. But even the ones when we don't know our families, we're shaped by them. We long to know our families. We have a longing in our hearts to, to be a part and to belong and know where we are and know our identity. Regardless of the situation, we, we are shaped by our families. In the, even in the absent moments, we're shaped by the idea of, well, our family is absent. It, it shapes who we are. And there are moments where we catch ourselves talking like our parents uh, or even, that we, even seeing things in our kids or our nieces or our nephews, phrases that we wish they wouldn't say that come from our families. Well, they shape how we interact with the world. They shape who we are. And for followers of Jesus, a major theme of God's saving work is being adopted into a new family. With God, our Father, whom we pray to, a new relationship is created where God creates a whole bunch of new uh, relationships and dynamics for us to be a part of. We have a new spiritual family. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a child of God and therefore be part of a new family, a new identity, a new framework for the existing, existence in the world. It's true to say there is no salvation outside the church. This new family, like our biological family, well, it reshapes us. This family teaches us what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to love, what it means to walk in truth, to walk in the Spirit, what lies are, what truths are. We are discipled by this spiritual family. And as we walk through uh, today, the teachings today, we're looking at uh, three parts, the challenges of being a part of God's family, uh, the, why it's healthy to and why we can of being part of God's family, and then some practical thoughts on how we can be a part of God's family. Uh, first we'll jump in, uh, challenges. One of the significant challenges of being a part of God's family, the church, is well, we're different to each other. There is an inevitability of conflict that happens when you bring people that have different backgrounds, different ideas, different thoughts together. Conflict happens, messiness happens, we, we will think differently and act differently. Now, this is exhausting. Uh, just like with our real families, we don't choose who our siblings are or who our siblings aren't, uh, and we don't choose who's in God's family. It's not, and so we're different. There's bringing together of a whole conglomerate of people that you're like, well, I wouldn't choose to go to church with them, but I'm a part of who they are, and I'm with them. And something else that comes with that is a, a challenge is that, well, we hurt each other. Members of God's family, 
it is true to say that we hurt each other. People connected and re- um, related uh, uh, by the nature of being in the same place and by being unthoughtful or sometimes in church out of sinful desires, we are unkind to each other. This is powerful. There's, there's hurt that comes from uh, the way that we interact as the church. Um, I've had a number of conversations with people where I've sat down and listened to them about their questions about faith and why they, some people why they've stopped following Jesus or why they don't want to be a part of church. And often it's not um, a philosophical conversation or a question about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, often it's, it's concern and hurt over their experience of church, their experience of the people of God. They, they're hurt by those moments and they don't see their connectedness with Jesus. We've got to come back to this idea. Uh, uh, individualism is a challenge for church. Um, the thought that I am my own person, I define myself, I am deciding who I will be. I don't want to be influenced by anyone else. I don't need other people. And the last challenge, the fact that church is time-consuming, it brings things into conflict with other parts of my life. It takes up a significant portion of time to invest in new relationships and new places. Uh, the things that you want to do get in the way of, well, church sometimes. But why is it healthy to? Why is it good for us? Let me jump into Ephesians chapter 4, which we had read uh, just before this. Uh, we see these powerful words uh, that shape and help us to think about, well, what is the purpose of communion? How is it shaping us? The key thought that we see there <coughs> is this. We need to recognize that uh, faith and maturity in Christ is a community project. Faith and maturity in Christ is a community project. Have a look at me uh, at verse uh, 11. We see this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, the equipping of God's people, uh, equipping of people to equip his people for the works of service so the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, God gifts people as a part of the church to equip the people to build up the church. There's this constant cycle moment of this constant building and, and pushing that, that, that actually the, the gathering of God's people who, people, God, who we are together, is actually the blessing that builds us as God's people. We need each other. I mean, our cultural tendency is, is growth, is an endeavor of, individual endeavor of self-control. But Scripture pushes us the other way to say, well, to see that the power of Christ-centered community is a key instrument in our own growth. See, church is more than a social gathering for the week to give us somewhere to belong. It's more than an interest group built around a fascination with a particular topic or skill. Paul's description of church that has Christ uh, as the center that he has created pushes back against both individualism, that we just work out life for ourselves, and also against uh, church as a social gathering. It pushes for something much deeper than that. It pushes for church as a transformative community. As we exist in relationships, they have an impact upon our lives, an impact upon our lives that reshapes who we are. As followers of Jesus, we become catalysts for growth in each other. We are a gift to each other to help us grow in maturity and unity. It's fascinating that God uses the ordinary thing of the gift of being gathered together, being in relationship with each other, as an instrument for growth in each other. Faith and maturity are not individual endeavors, but they're, they're built upon our presence in community together. And we see that well, there's a goal to God's family then. There is an outcome. There is a, there is a fruit or a produce, a, a result that comes from being a part of God's family that we're seeking. We see it there in verse 13. Uh, that There is a uh, unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God um, to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So there's a unity being around uh, who faith is in, being centered in the faith in the same person. We said earlier in chapter 4 that we're united and that we have the same person that connects us, the same salvation, the same spirit, the same Lord, one Father, one God, Father of all. There is a unity in our faith, the object and the nature of what our faith is. And there's also a unity built on knowing about a particular person, the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, it's not unity for the sake of being nice to each other and just having nice relationships. It's, it's a unity built on knowledge of the Son of God. It's, 
It's faith in Jesus that creates this family and it's knowledge of the Son of God that continues to grow this family. At the centre of church is an obsession with well, the story and wonder of one person. Knowing more, understanding more, seeing who Christ is, what Christ has done, what He has promised, what He has fulfilled, His character. And so we, we're constantly orientating towards Him. See, church is like, church is like that experience when you're at a wedding uh, and you, you're sitting down at the reception and you're sitting down next to someone you'd never met before uh, and you meet them and, and, the, and the moment that you have is, well, who are you here with? Are you here with the bride or the groom? And then you go through the whole process of working out, well, who are all your mutual friends and who do you know and who are we all connected with? Uh, and then you start working out there's people that you know that are the same people and you're connected and, you're, and, you're, and then you start talking and telling stories of those people that are the same and you go, oh, you know that guy. I love that guy. He's amazing. I have this great story about him. Church is a wonderful celebration of we know the same guy. We tell stories about him. We talk about the gift that person has been to us. Uh, the stories we have shared with him, we are united in the faith and knowledge of a mutual saviour. We are gathered around a person. We're gathered around just ideas or gathered around that we're the same culture. We're gathered around a person. A person unites us, brings together different people from different places to say, hey, I know that guy too. He's changed my life as well. Church is the place, God's family is the place where we celebrate uh, the origin of our family. And as we recognize that faith and maturity is a community project where we seek unity and faith and knowledge of the Son, well, Paul in Ephesians gives us another uh, tool to work with. He gives us an idea of, well, how does the community do that? How does the community become a place where uh, we are seeking uh, unity in faith and seeking unity in knowledge of the Son? Well, uh, in verse 14, it says this, 14 and 15, uh, then we will no longer be uh, infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head. Speaking the truth in love. There is a tool for the way that God's people will live together, for the way the family interacts. We speak the truth in love. We speak the truth based on our knowledge of the Son of God and our unified faith. We speak truth to deny lies, to undermine deceits. The fall began with a lie that Adam and Eve believed, and so the family of God is a support network that guards against and protects from deception. Speaking, professing, living to truth out together. It's a, the community together, we say, not that way, go this way. The tool is there, and so is the nature in which that tool is used. I mean, it is true that you can speak the truth in and of itself. And you can speak the truth as a blunt force instrument to the head. You can speak the truth to cause destruction. You can speak the truth to win, to look smart, to be in the right, to belittle another. But here we're saying, no, we speak truth to, to build. We speak truth to bless. We seek truth motivated by love. We speak truth with the motivation and the coating and the tone and the object of loving the other. We speak lovingly to protect from lies. We speak lovingly to guide and lead each other, to lead each other in truth. Uh, there's a story of um, <coughs> Japanese bees. Now, Japanese bees, um, they have this fascinating defense uh, mechanism that they use. Um, they get attacked by hornets. And what happens is the hornets come in and they, they, get, um, they go, get into the honeycomb and they get in there and they start attacking and killing off bees. And rather than hide and, and look after themselves, all the bees start attaching themselves to the hornets. And they start swarming around it and, and uh, cover the whole entire hornet with uh, their whole colony. They just wrap around it. And what they do is they start rubbing their wings together and creating an intense heat. And what they find is that the heat increases over and over, increasingly, increasingly, and the heat is surrounded all about the hornet. And what happens is uh, the hornet dies at a certain temperature, and the Japanese honeybee, well, it can last another 10 degrees. And so because of their combined effort, well, the hornet dies and the attacker is defeated. So the bee attacked, attacked the hornet individually, it would, it would be killed. But as a community, as they raise the temperature on that hornet, as they gather and support and, and, and uh, attack that attacker together, will they defeat the enemy? 
See, as we raise the temperature of speaking the truth in love as a community, as God's family, well, there is a blessing for us. It builds us up in the family mature in Christ. There is an individual benefit to, to the God's family that as we speak the truth, as we raise the temperature on speaking truth to each other in love, uh, it creates a beauty and it creates a maturity in us individually. We need to be a part, present, connected with God's family because the family of God is an instrument of Jesus' work in our lives. And why can we do this? Well, it's because Jesus has acted in love to bring us into His family. We are, we are the family of God if you're a follower of Jesus. You're part of the family of God because we've well, been loved by the same person. You've been invited into the same relationship. Jesus acted in love to bring us into His family so we can be living in love as His family. Through Jesus, we get to be in God's family. Where God is our Father, we are His children, we are adopted in. And Jesus speaks the truth in love to us. What that means is it shapes our culture as a family to not be a culture about uh, the desires of particular leaders or the desires of uh, particular dreams or thoughts or, or even just traditions. It becomes that our culture is about what Jesus cares about. He's the creator of our family, and so it becomes about what he is on about. When it comes to the challenges for community, well, when it comes to we are different, we are different, but actually uh, our origin in Jesus unites us. It's the best kind of equality. It's, it's a recognition of, well, we all come here for the same thing. I mean, many people would not even interact in church if it wasn't for Jesus, but we're brought together, we're united in the same story and the same Saviour and the same Lord. And when the unfortunate thing happens and we hurt each other, which is going to happen, we hurt each other and that is horrible. It's not okay, there's no need to pretend it's okay or be surprised when we do it or when it happens to us. And there's no point pretending and hiding it in any way. But what it means to be the family of God when hurt happens, it means that one, well, we get to have the joy of repenting to each other and acknowledging uh, our failings to each other and saying sorry. And we have the great joy of giving forgiveness that has been given to us. So in God's family, well, hurt is not the end of the story. Hurt is the opportunity to experience God's grace to us over and over and over again. It doesn't make the hurt okay, it doesn't play it down. But in God's family, when hurt happens, it's an opportunity for God to be working in amongst us, drawing us closer to Jesus. Individualism, uh, you and I as individuals needed the God of the universe to die for us to save us. If the God of the universe who um, needed to die for us to save us uh, needs to do that, it shows that we aren't good at self-defining, we aren't good at being by ourselves, uh, we aren't good at taking hold of our own destiny, we need Jesus and we need others. Now the question of the challenge of being, church being time-consuming, is it church uh, that's time-consuming or is it church or God's family getting in the way of life or life getting in the way of God's family? It's a question of well, what is the most important in this moment? If church is a space that is going to be a, a tool by, given to us by Jesus, an absolute gift uh, for our good and our maturity and our growing and our depth and relationship with Him and our strength and our resilience of faith, well, uh, then it's a gift that we can enjoy and receive. It's not simple, it's complicated, but if it is a gift, then it's, it's not time-consuming, it's a priority moment. It's a, this is a blessing for you, don't miss out. And finally, uh, thoughts on how to do this. Uh, one of the things in the midst of the season we're in, uh, being together as the people of God, as God's family, is actually ridiculously complicated. Uh, we know this, that it, you know, even uh, being in spaces uh, together is complicated, needing to social distance and then wear face masks or, or just be more conscious of what it means to be interacting, counting numbers as you walk into spaces. It's a complicated space to be together. And yet, there is a beautiful joy and there's a beautiful goodness in connecting with God's people, whatever that looks like. In this season, that is still an essential. It is still an absolute blessing to, to build each other up, to speak the truth in love, to act out the truth in love to each other, to profess the truth in love to each other, to share in Jesus, to pray for each other, to care for each other. It looks completely different in this season, that's right. But there are plenty of opportunities to and there is an incredible need to. Uh, and part of that is, well, it's actually 100% worthwhile to be turning up to church, whatever that church looks like right now. For some, it's being at home, 
Uh, for some, it's being in a building. For some, it's gathering with others uh, in different places. Uh, but there is a wonderful benefit in, turn, benefit in turning up to where uh, Jesus is at work in His people. The defining factor of uh, church is Jesus. Not which church, but Jesus. It doesn't matter which church you're going to. Go to a church where Jesus is at the centre. Turn up on your worst day, your best day. Um, uh, it teaches everyone around us that, well, it's not about turning up in the perfect state to come to church. It's turning up going, I'm here because this is where God has made me to be. Um, seek opportunities to learn about Jesus from others. We refine each other by asking questions of each other and learning from each other. Uh, there's the great fear uh, that there are, there are silly questions that you should never ask. The reality is there's no such thing as a silly question. Uh, well, there is such thing as a silly question, but it's a blessing when you ask it anyway. It's a gift to others when you ask a question because it gives an opportunity to think and to speak and to learn. Uh, my mate Dave, who um, uh, I was at church with for four or five years, um, uh, Dave is the kind of guy I was never going to have an intellectual conversation with. Dave and I would have never hung out uh, if it wasn't for church. We would never have talked. We, just, we wouldn't even run in the same social circles. But I'm absolutely blessed by relationship, being in relationship with Dave. I'm, I was challenged and rebuked by his willingness to serve. I was blown away by his uh, intentionality as he loved people and cared for people, his generosity and as he gave to people. He was a man of few words, but he spoke the truth in love by the way he lived towards others. My tendency is sometimes towards the other way, and so I was uh, blessed by seeing him and being part of community with him. I learnt from him. I saw the way of following Jesus. I was, the temperature of speaking the truth in love was raised in my life because I was a part of his life, because we were part of God's family together. Uh, connect with people, um, uh, get, in, get in a growth group, ask people to pray for you, prayer triplets, Bible reading, quadruplets, ask people to speak into your life and be honest about what they see, ask people to know you, to speak truth into your life, create and seek spaces where we are honest and authentic, where we are speaking the truth and love to each other. Uh, when we gather in community, we don't need to pretend that uh, we have it all together. The reason we're even in the building is because we don't. The reason we're even a part of God's family is we know that there is things that are deeply wrong about us, so we don't need to pretend that it's okay. We can seek spaces where we speak truth lovingly to each other. God's family is an instrument of your walk with Jesus, is an instrument of your maturity and your resilience of faith, is an instrument of blessing to you that is a gift from God. It's not simple, it's not easy, there's complications, there's questions to be asked. God has saved us into the God's family that might be a blessing to God's family and be blessed by God's family. Let's enjoy the gift. Let me pray. And Father, you are big and we are small. Thanks for being our Lord of all. Thank you that you save us into a community uh, centered around you, motivated by love for you, where truth can be spoken in love. Father, help us to uh, hear truth and to be loved and help us to love others and to speak truth. It is not simple and it is hard because of the messiness of being uh, human. We are not completely healed yet from sin. And Father, we thank you for the blessing of your forgiveness to us. Enable us to forgive and love those around us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, um, my name's Warwick, married to Joan. Um, we have three adult children and nine grandchildren, and they're spread around three locations in New South Wales. Uh, Joan and I attend the 9 a.m. service, uh, occasionally the 10.30, and before COVID-19, we were also attending 7 p.m. And we hope to be back there real soon. I was raised in a, you, you might say, a 1950s, 60s Christian family. Um, Mum in particular was very keen to make sure we went to Sunday school. Um, we got involved with the youth group. Um, and in my late teens, well, last year of high school, um, there was a Billy Graham crusade. And um, I went forward at that. Uh, I think I knew I didn't have to, but I sensed it was, it was, a, it was a, a good thing to do. And that, that fired things up for a good six months, 12 months. Um, 
Sadly, a few family, serious family losses happened during that time, or at the end of that time, uh, death of father and sister. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I went through quite a, 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 a falling away process in that grief uh, and found myself back at uni and, um, and yeah, drifting away from the things of the Lord. And then it was some 12 years later, when my mother died, that I came, well, you might say the Lord brought me thundering back into the Christian community. Well, in that time following my mother's death, uh, it, the, the Christian community was a wonderful support in my grieving time. But, but I think it was the knowledge that I'd gained um, through Christian community and Bible teaching in my youth that with the Lord's help and the Lord's grace and that Christian teaching for, for my, my youth um, w was what brought me back on track. The Christian community was a wonderful support. And then, of course, in the growth groups and the fellowship groups, uh, it, it, you grow, you grow in, in, in those. So wonderful time of support um, through a very um, dark sort of period, uh, and then um, wonderful encouragement to, to grow in. Uh, for me, there are so many aspects of, of Christian community that Joan and I tap into. Um, you know, well, there's, there's good teaching at church. There's growth groups. I'm in a men's Bible study uh, growth group on a Wednesday morning. There's a 7 p.m. growth group that Joan and I are involved with on Wednesday nights. So, so there's, there's Bible teaching in that. There's fellowship. There's um, encouragement and challenge. Um, that's so important. That's so important. Joan and I go off to see him in summer school every January, a week of fantastic teaching. And you know, you're singing with thousands of other people. I mean, that's a tremendous community, Christian community uh, growth time and encouragement. And uh, I run with Christian buddies and we chat as we're running. Uh, that's great. Um, oh, look, there's all sorts of ways that uh, uh, you wouldn't want to be without Christian fellowship. Um, uh, it, it grows me, it keeps me on track, uh, and uh, I'm reminded through that and God's grace, uh, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. What's different about Christian community, and well, to start with, we're, we're, we have a, a common saviour. Uh, we have a common point of reference in the scriptures. We're all sisters and brothers in the Lord. Um, we're going in the same direction. We've got the same Heavenly Father. We can share life's issues, the ups and downs of life, in um, the framework of the Christian gospel. Uh, and that's an enormous help. Um, we all have the same destination. So we can talk about the difficulties of this life in the knowledge that there's going to be a life to come that will just be perfect uh, with all the frustrations and grief and uh, anxieties of this life gone. Um, so, so that's a great blessing of Christian fellowship. That's just so wonderful. Um, and it's so missing um, with the community at large. And now, um, Joan and I would, would look back over the many years we've been at St. James uh, and our um, lives in, in other church situations, and we see um, the growth in young people. And when you've been at a church for as long as Joan and I have been at St. James, you see people uh, who you taught at Sunday school coming up through their teenage years then and youth group and, and kids ministry, and now uh, an MTS um, trainee um, having gone through your uni and had your uh, professional work as well. Um, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to see that happening all around you. So that's one of the things that inspires Joe and I when we go to 7 p.m. Uh, we get well taught, uh, it's wonderful Christian fellowship, and we get to see young people growing into mature Christians uh, and continuing to grow, which we, we all have to do. <laughs> we see the Lord at work in all of that um, because it is his work, isn't it? I mean, we hear the word, we get well taught, and we pray, Lord, uh, work in these people and grow them uh, to love and know you more and more every day, getting to, to really know uh, the Lord. Marvellous stuff to see and to be a part of and to have been called into. I've had the uh, joy of, of doing some gardening up at St James lately with the help of a couple of other blokes uh, and when we look out over that, that new mulched area and we see the young plants in it, 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 it again reminds me of what Christian fellowship is about. The mul lots of mulch is like lots of Christian fellowship. You know, those young plants are going to survive through the hot 
summer that's coming because of the moist mulch that's around them. And you know, Christians will survive the rough stuff of life when they're surrounded with other Christian friends. Um, when it's here and available, you've got to make use of it. Um, it's a bit like that plant in the garden uh, that was in a pot. Um, you know, before I had it under the tap, uh, it, it was around out of the way and it was by itself and not looked after, not cared for um, and doing its own thing, you might say. Well, I, I think when, when Christians feel they know enough and they can just sit on the sidelines and, and grow, um, I think it's very sad because they miss out on so much and the Lord calls us into fellowship. The Lord calls us not to wander away from um, His congregation and His people. He wa he's built us for relationship, relationship with Him, of course, and relationship with each, others, uh, with each other. And um, it's in those relationships that we're both challenged and encouraged. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a no-brainer. It's, <laughs> it's part of the deal, and it's all to our benefit.
So there's some great stuff coming up in the next few weeks in the life of our church community. And the first thing to draw your attention to is the 7 p.m. day away. Here's a short video to tell you more. Hey, 7 p.m. Unfortunately, as some of you guys already know, this year we're not able to have our 7 p.m. weekend away, but instead we'll be holding our own 7 p.m. day away. So it's gonna be on the 31st of October, which is a Saturday, and I'm gonna be looking forward to seeing you all there to spend a day hanging out, eating food, and learning about our topic, which is known for love this year. All you need to do is go to the St. James website where our registration is now live. Looking forward to seeing you there. Last year was my first year going um, and I think my favourite thing <laughs> was the food. It was really yummy. Um, there was these really good crispy potato things. I could talk about them all day. They were really delicious. But also getting to know other people from the congregation was also nice. <laughs> Although I won't have those delicious potatoes, I'm really keen to um, yeah, be in fellowship with people and kind of spend a good chunk of time with people from 7pm that I might not know as well. So yeah, it'll be nice to spend a solid day together, yeah. It just helps you to kind of refocus on the, the, yeah, the church around you and um, like I guess the body of Christ and how we can kind of grow and encourage one another together. It's so encouraging for you, but also just being there, you're encouraging other people, which is so great to think about. If you're not sure about coming, I definitely say give it a go. It's only a day. I, um, and I mean, I had such an encouraging time last year after uh, really tossing about whether or not I should go. If you're thinking about going and worried about like who you're gonna spend time with or worried about the day, definitely come talk to me. I'd love to make a new friend. And yeah, it's just such an encouraging, great time. So I'd definitely come along. I think being known for love is really about how the gospel and how uh, Jesus' love for us really impacts our day and really impacts how we, yeah, show love to people around us and um, yeah, are known for love in our communities and our, yeah, within our non-Christian circles. Oh my gosh, that would be really cool. I miss live music so much. Obviously, it's not been the same not seeing a church. That's really exciting. <laughs> Yay! And if you're in year 12 studying for your final exams, we're really praying for you guys. We hope to see you here on site for our HSC and IB study week, which is this week from Monday through to Friday. There's plenty of time to get your study done, but there's also plenty of time to do other stuff to fill up your tank so that you can actually study effectively uh, and do that well. Uh, so we hope to see you this week on site at our study week. And also at the end of the week is our Youth Not Camp on Friday night and on Saturday during the day. We're really looking forward to it. We think it's going to be a great time. We're looking forward to hearing from Mike Dicker about the book of 1 John to understand more about God's amazing love for us. And it's going to be a great time with some cool activities. We've got a pretty big one planned for the day on Saturday. So yeah, really looking forward to it and hope we can see you there. I want to say if you are joining us for the first time here in the church building or online, we're so glad that you've found us. There's a QR code that's about to come up on the screen and that's a way of saying hi and letting us know you were here or a way of responding to any of those other announcements we've just made or giving us feedback. Well, thanks for joining us. It's been great to connect with you as we keep thinking about how to deepen our walk with the Lord. 
to see you next week.